Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to introduce Raymond Yeshuafar, president of Sephardic Temple. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sephardic Temple Distinguished Lecture Series. Although we have not been able to be together physically, we've been together virtually for the past year, and we've had many distinguished speakers as <clears throat> programmed here. Tonight is no different, as we have Professor Deco with us sharing about her book with Rabbi Sessler. We look forward to seeing you and everyone at our Passover services coming up next week, in person and virtually on Zoom with Rabbi Sessler. And now at this time, I would like to introduce Rita Nafas, our VP of Social and Cultural. Good evening. Welcome everyone to tonight's event. We have a fascinating program planned for you and are thrilled to see this amazing turnout for Sephardic Temple's Distinguished Speaker Series. We at Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel are dedicated to providing you with great programming virtually and when possible in person. Please be sure to visit our website to see our previous programmed events on YouTube and to join our mailing list to receive information on future programs. Tonight, we continue our distinguished speaker series with our guest, author and professor, Michal Deco. Professor Deco was born in Haifa, Israel to a Holocaust refugee father and an Israeli born mother. After completing her mandatory milita military service, she went on to earn and LLB from Tel Aviv University's Buckman School of Law and interned at Tel Aviv State Attorney's Office and is a member of the Israel Bar Association. She moved to New York and entered a graduate program in English at the City College of New York. She then completed a PhD in comparative literature at Columbia University. In 2019, Professor Deckel published Tehran Children, a Holocaust refugee odyssey, which, which reconstructs her father's journey as a child refugee fleeing Nazi-occupied Poland during World War II. This book is the culmination of Professor Deckel's decade-long journey to understand her father and the odyssey at the core of his young adulthood. The fact that most Polish Jews were survived who survived the war had followed this path was virtually unknown when Professor Dechel began writing. Prior to Tehran Children, Professor Dechel has published two books, The Universal Jew, Masculinity, Modernity, and Zionist Movement, and the Hebrew monograph, Oedipus in Kishinev. Her scholarly work has received support from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Mellon Foundation and the, Lady, and the Lady Davis Foundation, among others. We are extremely excited to have Professor Deckel here with us tonight. In conversation with Professor Deckel, we have our very own Rabbi Tal Sessler. Of course, we know Rabbi Sessler. He is also a professor and author of Philosophy and Religion. What a pleasure to have you lead this conversation for us tonight. Without any ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome Rabbi Tal Sessler and Professor Deckel. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Rita and Raymond and Avi. Uh, I'm very excited. I wanna thank uh, uh, Professor Deckel and I decided as friends that will go by first name, Michal and Tal, so hopefully it's okay with everyone here. Um, I want to thank everyone and also start with a personal uh, word, if I may, uh, as I transition to become uh, this summer the Dean of the Rabbinical School at the Academy for Jewish Religion. This is the final member of the Distinguished uh, Speaker Series that I was honored to bring to Sephardic Temple. We've had in recent years Senator Joseph Lieberman, We've had 14 months ago Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Righteous Memory and many other 
empowering uh, thinkers and political and intellectual figures of our time. And I'm particularly moved that uh, Professor Deckel is here with us today because her book is a meeting point um, for all of us tonight uh, because we're all either refugees or descendants of refugees. And uh, the one seminal moment in which a first encounter occurred between um, Polish Jews and Persian Jews before we met in Israel and in Los Angeles took place during the dark days of the Holocaust in the early 40s. Uh, Michal, with your permission, I want to start with a with a one minute kind of framing of what we're doing tonight. And uh, towards the very end of your book, you recount how your father met your mother in Israel seven years after they bid farewell to each other uh, during the war. And it brought to mind um, my own grandfather and brother who met after the Holocaust in Israel as well. So I invite everyone who is watching to think about those relatives you were severed from, whether it is when you came from Iran uh, to Israel or to the United States, or whether it was when, your, when you or your parents or grandparents came to this country from Arab lands or from Europe. And um, I'd like us to start um, by saying that there are many stories and narratives and sub-stories and narratives to this very special book. And as Rita started saying, on the one hand, Michal's book is a tra trailblazing book in Holocaust literature, covering a quarter of a million Polish Jews who survived by fleeing eastward. Secondarily, it's a very moving memoir in which Michal learns bo both the geopolitical path of her father to better understand her father's uh, soul. And thirdly, as I said, there is the encounter between Sephardic and Persian Jewry and Polish Ashkenazi Jewry in Tehran. So, uh, Michal, why don't we start with you giving us, please, in general, broad brushstrokes, the, the journey of your family, your father and his sister and your parents from owning a nice brewery in a nice uh, Polish town before the war. When did they flee? How did they flee? What they went through in Russia and in, in uh, Uzbekistan? And how did, how did they get to Tehran? And once we get to Tehran, we'll focus more on that, if that's okay with you. Please. Yes, of course. You know, first of all, um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Tal and I have been talking for a long time. Uh, first about the book and then about making this event happen and then thinking maybe it could happen in person one day and then being disillusioned about that. Um, and I also want to thank you know, Rita and Avi and Raymond and, and all of you who are uh, with us tonight. It's such a pleasure to be speaking to you. Um, so I'm going to share, actually, I will share a few slides with you maybe um, by way of... Um, of explaining the journey that I covered. And um, just very quickly in terms of summarizing the book, the book is um, perhaps best described as part history, part memoir and part travel narrative in which I travel in the footsteps of these refugees. Um, the people that we are talking about are about a quarter million Polish Jews who ended up in 1939 on the Soviet side. And I'm going to show you, bear with me one minute, and I will share with you some photographs. Um, this is the cover of my book. Uh, let me just put it in slide mode. There is always this awkward moment when one shares slides, but here we go. Um, you see it, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, this is my father's family. Um, this is my father here on the right and his sister Regina and their parents behind them. 
Um, they are in, this is 1939, early 1939. They're in a town called Ostromazivieczka in Poland. Um, and after the outbreak of the war, so they're right here. And after the outbreak of the war, they flee to the Soviet side. So as we know, uh, as many, many, many of us know, Poland was partitioned in 1939, first Nazis occupied Poland, then the Soviets occupied Poland, and many Jews flee from the Nazi side to the Soviet side, which was not at all a trivial decision because they were, it was not clear at that point who is worse than the Germans or the Soviets. Um, uh, and by, 19, by, by late 1939, 1 1.5 million Jews live on the Soviet side. That, that is out of 3.3 million. So it's quite a big number. Uh, so again, these are people who fled there or who simply lived in those towns like Bialystok that fell under Soviet occupation. They are there then deported. Uh, some, I mean, sorry, some of them are deported of the million and a half about a Water of them, I mean, the numbers are very unclear, are deported to the Soviet interior, in the case of my father, to Akhangelsk in the north, in the northern Russia, uh, and to, they're deported to labor colonies, the labor camps, and are there for roughly 14, 15 months. They're later released, and we can talk about why later, and continue on, on a kind of second exile to, this, to the Soviet Central Asian Republics. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and mostly Uzbekistan, which is where my family was. Most Polish Jewish refugees remain there in Central Asia. And I, and I urge you to, I don't know if you can see the distances, but this is, this is why the book is called The Holocaust Refugee Odyssey, but this, because this is a real odyssey. I mean, this is, um, you know, thousands and thousands of miles, 13,000 altogether from, from start to end. So it's almost half the earth, the circumference that they, they cover. Um, here they go basically from this, from this northern tip of Russia to the southern tip of the Soviet Union. Um, and as I said, most refugees stay here and a minority, including my father and those children we call Tehran children, cross the Caspian Sea so they go from Turkmenistan right here to Bandar Pahlavi in Iran um, and, and, uh, and, and remain in Tehran. Let me see if I can share a few. So these, these are the refugees coming to Bandar Pahlavi. This is where they're disembarking. And most of these are Polish Christians who are part of the Polish army in exile, as well as Polish civilians. And among them are embedded Jewish refugees, including my father and his um, sister and cousin. This is, this, these tents are, were called the Jewish children's home of Tehran. Um, this is really part, this, this is really, there are like four or five tents and the structure that were part of a much, much larger Polish Christian refugee camp in the outskirts of Tehran. And this is where these, these children are. Um, well, you know, I don't know, I could, we could stop here and maybe you could ask me, this is a synagogue in Tehran and I can tell you more about it um, when you ask me more questions. Okay, thank you. Um... Michal, if you like, if, if you have more pictures from Tehran, uh, what I'm sure I'm fascinated as I'm sure everybody else is. Uh, but you know what, maybe we will take a little pause with your permission. And one of the many things that I've learned uh, from your book, Michal, is that, and, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, if you have a different opinion. As I was learning from your book that uh, the previous Shah, who was in power until 41, until he came into power, uh, Reza Pahlavi, I believe. Um, actually, Iran w had pro-Nazi leanings. And in 1935, which is the year German Jews in Germany were dehumanized through Nazi legislation, uh, similar measures were later were enacted by Prime Minister Daftari in Iran. That's what I learned. From your book, it, correct me if I'm wrong. No, not, not really. Okay, go ahead. Like, go ahead. 
Yeah. I mean, what I'm you... trying. Maybe the the real hero were the um, was, once the British came in, Iran kind of shifted its uh, its alliance to the to the Allies. Uh, but but why, why don't I let the expert explain those geopolitical intricacies? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in part, and you've read my book and you know it, I mean, I actually, I do try to, to focus on the complexities of each situation um, and, you know, not to so much focus on the, on the, on the kind of binaries. Um, in Iran in 1939, first of all, it's a neutral country. Let's start with that. So it's, it's, it's officially neutral with strong ties to Germany. And those ties go back to the 1920s when the Shah uh, brings in basically German engineers and builders who are basically, the, the Germans are modernizing Iran. Uh, so the Shah undertakes this big modernization program in the 19, starting in the 1920s. And Germans are undertaking that. And so there are strong ties and those ties do not stop with Hitler's rise to power. So it's not so much um, that uh, I don't th believe that the Shah is, you know, is, is you know, sort of, sort of explicitly pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic and so on, as much as it's a pragmatic relationship, um, it's also a way to, um, to, for him to, to sort of fight against the, uh, at the time, British and Soviet leaning. So he's kind of with the Germans and, um, and, and he doesn't see any reason to stop that. Um, Iran in 1939, I would say, is a neutral country with some pro-Nazi leanings. I mean, they're pro-Nazi Shia clerics, they're pro-Nazi intellectuals, they're pro-Nazi, um, they're sort of racist uh, journals um, and also there, are, there, is, um, there, are, there are direct broadcasts from Berlin. Um, there, are, there are some Gestapo presence and in sort of the German embassy and so on. At the same time, and, and I talk about that in my book, Iran, beginning with the rise of Hitler, is also allowing German Jewish refugees and Austrian Jews to settle in Iran, uh, according to certain... Um, professional categories, again, engineers, um, um, musicians, for whatever reason, um, and other categories, lawyers, who are allowed into the country simply for pragmatic reasons. Um, and they, so it's, it's, it's a place, so you, you could say that it's a very schizophrenic place, because as we know, this is a time when many other countries didn't allow uh, Jewish refugees in, and, and Iran did. Um, so you have almost this, this community where German Jews and German Nazis and others are living together. Um, and if you, you know, I can show you in a minute some um, slides from these, from these refugees because they had a kind of different lives than the Polish refugees. Um, they also remained there longer. They remained until the end of the war. So, so this is Iran. Um, of course, then in... 1941, when the the British the Anglo, the, the basically and the Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran um, happens, they depose of the Shah. They put his younger son, his 23-year-old son, in power, um, and then basically it becomes a, you know a kind of a country that's much more hospitable. It's sort of explicitly and openly hospitable to to these refugees and other foreigners. Um, and, you know, at that point, they basically um, remove the Germans, they send the German engineers home, they send the German, um, or the, the German Nazis home, they almost send the German Jews back to Germany as well, um, since they're sort of labeled as Germans, and, you know, the, the British embassy saves them, but that's, that's not in my book, I learned that after I published the book. So this is Iran uh, after, uh, during this time. Okay, just a minor point about that to make sure I understood things right. Was there a point before the uh, transition from one shot to, to another, from father to son, where, where, where Jews had to uh, resign from uh, governmental positions or something to that extent? Uh, the Jews were not, I, I think um, there was um, tremendous fear 
but it, the fears didn't come to be realized. Okay. Um, that was um, so there was there was a there was a lot of um, tension, and there was some anti-Jewish. There were some anti-Jewish communities, and there was some some there were some activities, but uh, there were no um, um, you know yellow star of David or I mean, there was sure. the, the community was not segregated during the okay. war. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you for this. Um, for me, having read your book. Um, the most um, moving segment of it in terms of the, the brotherhood and sisterhood inherent, inherent to, to Jewish peoplehood uh, was when you described principally, I think also through the eyewitness account of Rabbi Dr. Hirschberg, who was um, in Iran at the time, um, the meeting between the children, the refugees, and the local Jewish Persian population. Um, one of the things that I found very uplifting uh, with regard to Persian Jewry during this time is that, um, if I, again, if I understood your book correctly, uh, Tehran Jewry ended up um, giving uh, to those refugees more than the Jewish agency did. Am I correct? And the JDC, the Jewish Distribution Committee. Yeah. So, so I want to go ahead at some point. Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, I mean, they were the first to to um, to embrace these children and to be in these refugees because um, you know there was not that um, the people from the JDC people could simply you know hop on a plane and come to Iran sort of right away. I mean, the whole the whole thing it took a long time. Um, the whole aid operation that began to be conducted in Iran and it became a very big aid operation. And the same goes for the Jews of Palestine. They couldn't just, you know, just come. Um, and the Iranian Jews were there on the ground and uh, there was a, a, um, a refugee aid committee that actually consisted of some uh, Persian Jews as well as Iraqi Jews who, who were also refugees in Tehran at that point, as well as some of these German Jews who, were there, who had been there before. Paul, are you with us? And they, okay. yeah. Did, okay. You, did you, did I get? Maybe, maybe it's my computer who froze. I don't know, please continue. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, now, there were also there are all kinds of political um, issues governing this. For example, the JDC. Part of the reason the JDC didn't give money initially is because these children were under the the care of the Polish government in exile. Um, officially, the, officially, there were Polish citizens within a Polish refugee camp, and they were trying to push the Polish government to provide for these children. And they're, you know, they didn't want to kind of jump in right away with Jewish aid. Um, but, you know, whatever the political circumstances, I think there was a very, um, you know, heartwarming um, aid uh, in, in that, that, that happened right away. Um, I actually recently, I mean, I, I just started showing you before a photo of um, the synagogue where these children are taken. And there's, as you said, I mean, what I found that that um, and maybe I can read from it, or you can read from it. But that yeah, description, you should, you should. yeah, um, the, the description of the children going to um, to the synagogue. So, they, so it's the children came, and big, the biggest group came in August 1942, and of course that was just before the high holidays of 1942. Uh, so very quickly there was Rosh Hashanah and then Yom Kippur, uh, and the, the Rabbi Hirschberg, who was a, a Polish-born rabbi. Uh, who was one of four rabbis who came with this transport, wrote a little a short memoir. And he describes, first of all, he describes his own experience of, for the first time in three and a half years, walking in a city openly with his talit and his yarmulke on the way to the synagogue, which was an incredible experience for him. Um, and also, he describes seeing the children. It was decided that the older children who were in the camp would be taken for Yom Kippur services. Um, they were in a synagogue 
called Chaim and Daniel, which a part of which was cordoned off to serve the Ashkenazi, um, the Ashkenazi refugees, basically. I mean, I'll show you, I'll share with you again, if you, if you don't mind. And I'll show you. So this, let me, this is the synagogue. Oops, going back to, this is the synagogue, it's called Chaim and Daniel Synagogue, which still exists today. And this is the Torah Ark. And if you read Hebrew, as I know you do, you could read it. It says, Beit HaKneset HaYehudim HaEropim, the synagogue of the European Jews. Um, so this was actually a, kind of a half of a, an existing synagogue that was dedicated for that. And um, these children were taken to the synagogue. In part, this was a kind of fundraising event where they, the, the, the thinking was that they would bring the children, you know, it looked very bad and it was a very sorry sight. And, um, and, they, um, and, 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 and he describes that the local people seeing them just started right. It just started crying. I'm actually looking for my um, for, for the page here because uh, I, I wasn't planning on reading, so I don't have it open. Um, and uh, but it's 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 um, you know it was an incredibly um, incredible moment for him for for him to to see um, to see people react. And, and, and as you said, for me too, this was a moment of um, these two communities coming together in, in a very moving way. Um, let me see. I, I found it, Michal. It's on page, I think it's on page 274. Okay. Um, 274. Yeah, it's 274. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the second and third paragraph. Yes. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just read you, um, yeah, I'll read you a little bit. Um, da -da -da. So I'm saying, I'm talking about this Chaim and, and, Chaim and Daniel synagogue. It, it sat up to 60 people and shared with, with Chaim with, it, with uh, so Daniel was the, the, the Ashkenazi side and Chaim was the, the Sephardic side. Uh, it shared with Chaim a courtyard into which Hanan, my father, and the other children entered. The Persian adults who had begun to assemble stood and talked quietly. There were children playing amid the Pomeranian trees. Above the arched front door, a sign in ornamented Hebrew and Persian letters read, this is the gate for God through which the righteous shall pass. Inside was brown gold and Persian plum, the sparkle of chandeliers and lots of the Persian blue I had seen in the tiles of Samarkand's mosques and mausoleums. On the cerulean velvet Torah ark, the words which you see here, Beta Knesset HaYudim HaEropim, Synagogue of the European Jews, were embroidered in gold. The locals gave the children little gifts and sat with them for, Kol Nidre, for the Kol Nidre prayer. Then, when they noticed the younger children were absent, they sent a car to fetch them, despite, the, despite what their, even, their, their secular counselors knew as strict prohibition against driving on Yom Kippur. Everyone was already seated by the time the five and six-year-olds and the toddlers walked into the synagogue. When the worshippers saw these children, they, began, they all began to weep. Tears rolled down the men's cheeks and the women wept violently, Dr. Herzog recounts. Um, I even get tears in my eyes now when I read it for the hundredth time. So, um, and in fact, um, recently somebody told me here in Israel that they actually were bar mitzvahed in the synagogue. So there was somebody, one of these children who was taken by the local community to be bar mitzvahed here. So, uh, you know, it wasn't the whole community, but there is certainly a group that was, that was working to, to help these children. Right, and and then um, I, I don't know if you if you want to converse or to read this other paragraph on page two seventy nine, where he talks about the fundraiser at the Iraqi synagogue and how um, uh, thirty 
says here, the children ran home and took out whatever they had in their savings, right? Yeah. So that, that Yom Kippur fundraiser was, was a big success. Um, you know, the, I, I wrote the synagogue fundraiser was a phenomenal success. At the Iraqi synagogue, thousands of Tomans were given. And at, the, even at, in, and at the poorest synagogues in the Mahala, nearly every worshiper placed a few Tomans in the, in the tzedakah box. Us children ran home and took out whatever we had in our savings. Um, Heshmat Kirman Shahi told me, and this is a man that I interviewed who is, who is, who is in LA. Um, the total was 30,000 Tomans, the equivalent of $6,000, as Dr. Hirschberg put it, an astronom astronomical amount by their standards. It was just the beginning of giving that by the end of 1942, would total $14,500. $4,500 from Iraqi Jews alone, excluding clothing and other supplies that were delivered directly. Um, so this was noted by, by the JDC officials you know, later on. Um, and and Iraqi, uh, Iranian Jews were also involved. Um, later on, there begins to be, let me see if I can find the... Oh, that's good. This is, uh, by the way, this is Harrisburg. Um, this is Rabbi Hirschberg. Would you show us again the physical condition of the of the children so people can yeah. get an idea? Thank you. Yeah, so these, so, as you can see, yeah, this is in a Tehran hospital. Um, and I think many of you know the story of Dr. Sapir, and who was a Persian doctor who treated refugees and, and contracted typhus and died from typhus. Um, the, the children were the children and other refugees, and especially the Jewish refugees, more so than the other Polish refugees because they received less aid. Were in very very bad shape. I mean, they really looked like um, it's like photos we know from from concentration camps. Um, they were uh, under conditions of extreme malnutrition in the Soviet Union, especially in Central Asia in 1942. Um, in 1942, this is before they came to Iran, the, that was the beginning really of, I mean, after the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, that was the war, the war started and Central Asia became the kind of labor front of the Red Army of the, of the Soviets, which meant that the idea was that they would take the food from Central Asia to feed the army. And if whoever was there died, they died. Um, and of course the refugees were at the bottom of the food chain. So, Starvation, diseases that are connected to starvation and low hygiene, malaria, typhus, eye diseases. And you can see the children's eyes this are shut. Um, they had trachoma. Uh, uh, many children died in Iran uh, and are still buried in Iran. Uh, children and other refugees. Um, and and um, so they came there and they died. But Iran was really the first place where they, they had bread. You know, and they, they, and they comment on that constantly that, that they have bread and, um, and, and this is by the way, a German, this is a German Jewish family who was in Iran, the Lepman family. They were in Iran starting 1934. Um, and as you can see, they are, you know, in much better shape in the sense that they came as professionals and, and they work there. Um, it doesn't mean that their life was easy. It was a little scary at times because, I, again, I remind you that they lived with among Nazis and you know, and among in some danger. Um, but they did live. I mean, they skied and they have they had um, this was their their um, cook, their Persian cook. Um, this is the group of children who were Tehran, the older children were Tehran children. This is my father here is the fourth from the, from the, from, from, uh, in the top row from, from the right. The one with the hair, which always makes me happy because he somehow, the children had lice and they had to have had their hair cut and he somehow was able to keep his, his mane. Um, but here, so this is what I wanted to show you. So this is at some point, at a later point, the representatives from the JDC, from the Joint, Joint Distribution Commission in, and from Palestine arrive in Tehran and Tehran becomes basically the basis, the place from where packages are sent 
eight packages are sent to refugees who remained in the Soviet Union, who remained in Central Asia. Um, and in here too, many Iranians were involved in working, helping to buy things and, 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 and using their own sort of local connections to, to help with this, this project. I'm gonna stop sharing. Go back. Okay, great. Uh, we're gonna take some questions very soon. Um, uh, the, uh, I want to make uh, just one remark before we uh, take some questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hirschberg also notices as an Ashkenazi rabbi the distinction of uh, Persian and Middle Eastern Jewry and how it's different from uh, Ashkenazi Jewry. He notices that a lot of the communities are lay led. Uh, without a rabbi, he sees that uh, Yom Kippur is a festive, uplifting, uh, joyful uh, Chag, rather than the Ashkenazi fear and trembling, and uh, halachic pragmatism, mm -hmm. people also uh, finding ways to commute uh, to synagogue during the high holidays. Uh, I thought that was also very interesting for us to learn about. But, you know, we have many people here who would like to ask questions. So, um, okay, so an anonymous uh, attendee wants to vehemently uh, protest and reiterate your point, Michal, that the great Reza Shah was not with caps, anti-Semite, nor was his son, the late Muhammad. In fact, they liberated Jews and were very favorable. Towards well, the Jews I, yeah. Well, maybe I wasn't understood. I, I, that was my point as well. I mean, yes, he, right, he, as right. I said, yeah, he absolutely. was not. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. I think um, right. Um, but I, um, I should say that um, you know, my book came out in 2019, and a lot of people write me. Uh, so I've also learned a lot after my book came out. Um, you know, and especially about Iran. And you know, I, I learned, for example, that some of these refugees stayed in Iran and so on. So I'm happy also to not only take questions, but to, you know, learn from from your um, your attendees and audience. Great. Okay. So we have uh, another question, um, which. Uh, I'll let you answer. Uh, could refugees come without a visa the way they uh, were able to get to Shanghai? And after that, as you can probably see in your screen as well, I assume, what was the Shah's motivation in allowing refugees into Iran? Um, they, could they come without a visa? I mean, they, they technically needed a visa. Uh, and not only, I mean, if we go back to these German Jewish refugees, not only, not only did they need a visa, but they need to renew that visa every, I don't remember if it was six months or every year. Um, but um, in practice, there were many stowaways and many people who entered in all kinds of ways, uh, especially in among the Polish refugees. What I learned is that even though there was not a big number that was there. So as I said, most of the Polish refugees who came were Christian Poles. Uh, and there were about 6,000 Jews who came as part of this group. So there were about 116,000 Polish citizens. Among them, about 6,000 or so, including these children, are Jewish. But that number is a little bit misleading because in fact people more people more jews than that came they came with all you know kind of as fictitious spouses of polish officers as um you know some people had these sort of quick conversions or mock conversions to catholicism and then they converted back or, or not um some people simply um for example the the um, man who was the head, David Lao, who was the uh, Lauenberg at the time, was the head of this Jewish children's camp, the director. He kind of, he came with a Polish soldier's uniform. He traded his uniform. He bought a Polish soldier's uniform and just came, was able to get on those ships. So um, it's, you did need a visa, but you also, many people came in all kinds of ways without visas. Um, to the second question, 
Um, this, what was the motivation of the Shah to allow, I mean, the, again, Iran at that point, you could say was an occupied country. Um, it was occupied by the allies and the allies more or less um, imposed, you know, I mean, said that this is what's going to happen. But at the same time, again, we have to recognize <coughs> that there was still consent because if we look at um, Iraq, for example, Iraq was also under the control of the allies, but Iraq was much more resistant to, <coughs> excuse me, to these refugees. I and mean, if you, if, I don't know if you saw on the map, but, um, and maybe we can talk about the children continuing on to, to, to uh, mandatory Palestine, Eretz Israel, but it, to, try, to drive from Tehran to Tel Aviv, it's very easy. It's very close. It, you can go by land, just, I don't know, 48 hours or 60 hours and so on. But in the middle was Iraq and the Iraqi prime minister, who was also under British control, would not allow Jewish children going to Palestine to go through Iraq. Uh, and, and even we even have the intervention of Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor Roosevelt writes to him and says, please, this is a humanitarian case. These are children. And he says, I feel very bad for these children. We'll be happy to keep them in Iraq if you pay us for their upkeep, but we're not going to let them cross to Palestine because this is already in the middle of the Jewish-Arab conflict in Palestine. Um, so the fact that, so e what I'm saying, I guess, is that even though Iran was under occupation, it was, it was still, um, welcoming on some, you know, on some level and definitely on the kind of human level, because as, as I write in my book, there were many instances of simply, of simple, especially in the beginning when these children arrive, they describe uh, a lot of instances of, of, of just, of, of just basic humanity, people bringing them food or crying when they see them and so on. Do you have some uh, more photos that you want to narrate for us with? Let me see. Uh, if I can do that. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about, if you want, about the children's arrival in, uh, in, sure. in Palestine. Um, and I'll show you the map as well to reiterate but I just, sorry, it keeps going back to the beginning. Uh, but if you just look at the map, I just want to show you. So here is, here is um, Iran, here is Tehran, and here is Tel Aviv. And so you can see this is, this is very close. Um, but in, because their children were not allowed to go this way, they had to take this incredibly, incredibly long and also very dangerous route. I mean, this is a war. The war, this is a war that's also happening at sea. So they're basically taking ships through the Persian Gulf, right here, through the Indian Ocean, which is, which is um, full of German sea mines. I mean, the, again, this is an incredibly dangerous journey that could have ended up very differently than it ended. Uh, and then through the Suez Canal and into, and, and by train to, to Egypt and by train into Palestine. Um, so this, and, and, and in the middle, they were, they spent three weeks in Karachi, which was then India. Um, let me see if I can share some more photos with you. This is, this is a ship going from Turkmenistan to, um, to Bandar Pahlavi, um, mm -hmm. the port town of Bandar Pahlavi. Uh, this is Bandar Pahlavi at the time. Um, this is, is really interesting. Um, so in, in um, one of the testimonies that I had, one of my best sources was the travel diary that one of these children wrote. He wrote it in Polish. It was translated. Emil Landau? Emil Landau, yes. Yeah. So Emil Landau wrote a, a travel diary. And in the travel diary, he writes... We came to, you know, we, we got off, it's amazing. And we see these Tudor Baker trucks on, in the port. And when I, I read it years and years ago, and I was thinking, what, what is he talking about? What are the Tudor Baker trucks doing there? Um, then, you know, it took me a while to realize that this is, these Tudor Baker trucks are American trucks 
This is part of the American aid to the allies that's being shipped through Iran. Uh, and, and a lot of the aid in the beginning stage was, was done actually through the shipment of trucks, Chevrolet trucks. And, and so this is a Studebaker ad in Life magazine in 1943, and it's a picture of, kind of a drawing of Iran. And it says, Studebaker military trucks like our Yanks are certainly seeing the world. So we have, again, this, this meeting point, right, of America and Iran and the Jews of Palestine and um, these Polish Jews um, all in, um, in, in this one place. And in that sense, my book is almost, you could say that it's a kind of a global history of, of the Holocaust in some way, very different from the story. I'm, so, I'm sorry if there's noise. I'm, there's a kind of garbage truck here behind me. It's early in the morning in Israel. Yes, um, this is Dr. Sapir, who was the Persian Jewish doctor who died caring for refugees and has a hospital still to this day named after him in Iran. This is the Lequin family, as I said. Um, these are um, members of Solel Bonnet, which was the construction brigade Jews from Palestine who came to Iran at the same time. Um, so it, so again, you know, you talk about the geopolitical, the geopolitical kind of consequences of the story, and they, they, they are many. So it's not just the story of these refugees, it's the story of what happens into the local communities and geo, into the, you know, British Empire and Soviet Empire while this story is happening. Now, why are, what are these, what are these Solel Bonnet people doing in Iran? Um, it's simply that, as I said, the Allies invade Iran, the Anglo-Soviet the Anglo, the, the Anglo -Soviet forces invade Iran, they kick, the German, they kick the Germans out, then they're kind of left without workers in the, for the Anglo-Iranian um, oil company, um, and they're saying, you know, who's going to be, who, 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 where are the engineers going to come from, and so on, and then Churchill says, well, you know, bring the Jews of Palestine, you have engineers there and construction works. And so these people are brought and many of them actually double as um, basically clandestine um, agents, workers for the Jewish Agency of Palestine. Um, so they help with the children as well, clandestinely, not all of them, but many of them. Um, and, many, and some of them remain there in Iran later on. Um, so that's that. There's a there's a very interesting group. So this this is my father in kibbutz in Harod. Um, so the, they, the, these children arrived in this group. There were two groups, but this first group arrived in Palestine in February on February nineteenth, nineteen forty three, and as you can see, this was um, a, a huge celebration for the Yishu, for the Jewish population in of Palestine. Um, schools were closed, school children came out, uh, people shouted. I mean, this was the first group of refugees who came as a group from, you know, from that hell that everybody has been hearing about, but didn't really know for sure what was happening. And, um, and this was a very foundational moment for Israelis of a certain age. When you interview Israelis of a certain, it's like the moment, you know, the day Kennedy was shot I and mean, Israelis will say, I remember the day the Tehran children came, people, people of a certain age. Um, and um, once the children come, they're after a while, they're distributed between different kibbutzim, collective settlements, as well as um, mostly institutions in the Mizrahi. It's, it's, it's uh, the um, religious Zionist movement and um, and um, and this is where they're raised. This is the, this is the the gravestone of a little girl who is. This is from now, from Iran today, who is buried. So you have basically these gravestones of Polish Jews inside the Jewish cemetery in Tehran. Um, this is uh, me interviewing a woman, a Jewish. The Polish Jewish woman who in Samarkand in Uzbekistan. Um, so I traveled to Poland, I traveled to Russia, to those areas that where the refugees were, were sent to, um, which was you know, quite an experience. And I traveled to Uzbekistan. I did not travel to Iran. 
Um, even I have an American citizenship, but you know, it didn't seem like a wise thing to do at the moment. And um, but but I had research people research for me there. Um, this woman basically came to Uzbekistan, but and remained there. So she didn't continue. For her, what was for my father and for most for many of the refugees, a point of transit was for her, became home for her. She married an Uzbek man and she lives in Samarkand. I mean, I hope she's, I interviewed her in 2013. I hope she's still alive. Um, and that was quite, to me, that was quite interesting because I hadn't, you know, when we think about a refugee journey, we think about sort of going from point A to point B. But in fact, this was, people stayed in every point along this, along the way, and people then became Russians or Uzbeks or Iranians. Um, this is um, from Khor Sosinaiz, uh, an Iranian director who made a, a film called The Lost Requiem about the Polish refugees in Iran. Uh, of course, most Iranians don't really realize that there were Jews among the, the, ref the Polish refugees. They simply think that they're, they call them the Polish refugees. Um, this is, um, this dude here is um, the son of a Polish mother and, um, and an Iranian father. And there were quite a few Polish women who married Iranian men and remained in Iran, in, including a, a few Jewish women as well. And so he, they owned, a, they own a shoe store still today. And in the basement of the shoe store, there's like some kind of like sort of makeshift archive of these documents of these refugees. Um, and this is, um, these are children who are a family that was adop adopted children in Uzbekistan. Among them were Jews and other ethnicities. Um, maybe I'll, you know, I'll stop here. This is a lot of information in, in a short time, but uh, you know, you can get the, the other parts in my book. Right. Um, so uh, another question. Uh, so how, is how long did um, did the children uh, stay in Iran all in all before they embarked on their journey to the land of Israel, known then as Mandatory Palestine? Right. Um, so there were there were, um, so there were um, sev several um, timelines. I mean, some of them, they stayed anywhere from um, five months to um, about a year. Um, and then, as I said, some of them, some Jewish refugees, the Jewish refugees who did not continue to El Israel remained there. I mean, some of them remained in Iran until 79, right? I mean, if they, if, they, if they married Iranian men, some of them, many of the, the German Jews and others who were left in, after the war was over. So they left in uh, the 1940s, the late 1940s. Um, some of them remained in Iran and were later transported to other places, including Lebanon and 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 and, um, and then uh, Mexico and, other, and so they didn't they didn't take the route of um, of going to to El Israel and they they ended up in other places. So there are different different um, different groups. But you know, I should say that even after the refugees leave, the Jewish agency for, members of the Jewish agency of Palestine as well as members of the JDC remain in Iran. And as I said, they continue with this package program until the end of the war. Um, and in many ways, uh, as I see it, the, I mean, I'm sure many people who are in the audience know that Israel and Iran had relations until 1979. And the seed of those relations really begins then with that connection that is made with the Shah uh, between members of of, um, a, of of the Jewish Agency of Palestine and the, the young Shah, and then they, and of course they flourished later on in the sixties and the seventies. Thank you. Um, so um, there is um, an, uh, another comment here. So uh, some um, person by the name of Haida Herbert. 
makes the historical claim that under Reza Shah, there was an agreement with Nazi Germany to consider uh, Persian Jews Aryans like other Iranians uh, who simply have a different religion? Yeah, I mean, yep. it's, it's, Iran is, uh, Iran is, is um, means Aryan, right? Um, Iran, sure. Aryan, and, and I think, and there was um, I mean, a lot of, um, the, 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 the kind of, in a way, the racist um, journals were also about, I mean, the idea was like, these are the Aryans of the East, right? I mean, so they're, they're, they're not, the Germans are the Aryans of, of Europe and these are the Aryans of the East and, and the Jews, and, and I think, and there was an agreement. Yes, there was an agreement that Jews were, would be considered and, they, and therefore they were exempt, exempted basically from being ostracized and so on. Uh, but they were also, again, I feel like Iran was, um, and maybe still is a very schizophrenic place. I and mean, I mean, there was a threat from some groups, I mean, in Loristan, um, there were some groups who were very pro-Nazi and, and at the same time there was protection um, and it all existed together in one place. Okay. Um, but, it, but it's more than in a lot of other places, right? When there was nothing, I mean, there was just rejection. And dehumanization, absolutely. Um, so, um, so before we conclude, I see uh, we have no more um, questions uh, coming in at this point. Do you have any remaining uh, photos or did we uh, exhaust them? Did, did you show um, us the... Uh, yeah, I can show you a little bit more. Uh, let me see what I have in here. Um, sorry. Oh, um, there's something that comes to mind from the book while you're flipping through the pictures. There, yeah. there is um, there's a very powerful scene you share in the book where a scholar whose first name is Salar that kind of co-worked with you for a right. while and was your yeah. person on the ground. There he is in, in Tehran where you describe how he took a video uh, in current day Iran of uh, the local Jewish population praying, I believe it was Yom Kippur, which happened to coincide with Ashura. And you see the, the Shiites uh, marching and flogging themselves. And, and you see kind of the disparity of power, the way you analyze it uh, between the Jewish worshipers and the Shiite worshipers. These are very fascinating um, uh, videos about that interaction today. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I wish I could show you the video, um, but um, that I can at the moment. But yeah, so I had, um, you know, I, I wrote this book. I worked on it for ten years, and the places where I researched um, are hard places to research in. And part of why I'm, I'm telling a story that's new, I mean, it's, it's kind of astonishing, right? That this is a story of a quarter million people that hasn't really been told uh, is because it's very hard to research in these places. Uh, for one thing, the Nazis documented everything they did, including executions, and they had lists of deport people that they deported to Auschwitz. The Soviets um, basically masked everything they did. There is nothing. So, um, and of course, in Uzbekistan was a dictatorship and very hard to research in. And you couldn't just go and say, you know, take me to the KGB archive and they would just take you. Uh, and you, to Iran, I couldn't travel. So I had a kind of uh, research associate in every one of those places. And Salar was my, my man in Iran, still is. Uh, and, um, he was very invested in the project. And in fact, his questions were what got me initially started working on this project. Uh, and Salar, as this happens, and maybe it's some kind of, maybe it's not a coincidence, I don't know, it's very strange, but as it happens, he bought an apartment in Tehran and that apartment was right across from the Chaim and Daniel synagogue. And he would take videos for me from his window. And one of those videos was exactly that, as you describe on Yom Kippur, where you see 
you know, very few worshipers in the synagogue um, behind a wall and in front of them, people are marching, flogging themselves, not, not, not sort of real flogging, but sort of mock flogging and dances and so on. And, um, and Salar was, um, you know, one of the things that I describe and I talk about in my book is the, the difference in narratives that you get. So everybody has their own narrative. And I mean, Salah was very, very helpful, but at the same time, he, you know, he, you know, he would say, look how this is, what a beautiful scene. And I would say, well, you know, there, it's a little bit threatening, you know, when you're inside a synagogue and, you know, there are very loud speakers and so on. So, um, you know, I describe, so a lot of my book is about the mem collective memory, right? Collect Jewish collective memory, um, Persian collective memory, Polish collective memory, Russian collective. This was my, my host in Poland, who is actually, you know, a Polish conservative historian who is actually now part of the Polish government. And she had her own narrative. Um, her parents hail from my father's town. Uh, this was my host in Russia, who was a kind of mini oligarch who took me around, opened doors for me. It was very good. Um, and this was my, um, my, my helper, my research assistant in Uzbekistan, just a wonderful, wonderful man. And this is a kind of a, maybe a good place to end because he, he was, um, and by the way, all of these are sort of fake names. Except Salaris's name is not because, you know, these people are, it was risky for them to help me. It's not that, again, it's not so trivial that you could just research in these places. And um, so he was, his family was also deported to exile to Uzbekistan. Ethnic Koreans who were living in this, within Soviet borders were also deported and under very harsh conditions. And he had his own stories. And just as Salaro had his own story of being a refugee of the 1979 Islamic revolution. So, you know, people are helping you, but they are, they're not tabula rasa. They have their own history of, of uh, hardship. Um, and he was very, he was a wonderful person. He was very devoted to, to my research. In fact, in, in, in part because he had grown up with all these sons and daughters of Jewish refugees and went to school with them in Uzbekistan. Uh, and, and he still was in Uzbekistan. He, and he said to me, so at some point, um, I said to him, he was telling me his story. I said, you should write your own story. You should write the story of your people. And he said, you know, we're not like you Jews. We don't have our history. We don't have people like you writing our history. And, and then I realized, you know, that, you know, as, as difficult as our fate is as a people, we do have our history and our collective memory. And there are people like me and of course, many other people who collect it and write it and we have museums and so on. And, you know, for some many, many groups like that, there really isn't any kind of collective commemoration or research to fall back on. And you know, I thought I found that very, again, one of the very moving moments in, our, in, my, in my journey. Right. So again, um, maybe to conclude, as you say, um, one of the things that I also found striking, you say at some point that uh, in order, and I'm paraphrasing your words, hopefully with justice, that in order to know the pain of others, of other peoples, other nations, other cultural groups, first of all, you have to come to grips uh, with the tragedy and, and painful history of your own people. And then you can also have universal regard um, for others, which uh, is obviously a very worthy statement. Somebody asked where the where the book can be purchased. Uh, so uh, we all know of a very marginal bookstore called Amazon. Uh, Michal shared with me that uh, the book would also be available in paperback in English in the fall, and it's forthcoming in German and in Hebrew. Uh, we look forward to all of that, and we want to thank you very much, Michal, for. Uh, speaking to us uh, well into the night or the early morning uh, in Israel. It's been a pleasure and very educated for all of us. Um, thank you for everything and we wish you uh, lots of Hatzlacha with your future uh, research and all your worthy endeavors. 
And I uh, thank everyone for attending and return the stage to uh, Rita, please. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all for, I, I know that it, you know, I, I also organize events. I know it takes a lot of effort to organize events and, and um, yes, and thank you for all of you out there. And um, yeah, by all means, buy the book, support the book. Um, and feel free to, um, I mean, if, especially if you have information about my story <clears throat> and if you have more stories, you can find me on social media and you can find me on my website, on my faculty page. So uh, please reach out to me and share anything with me. I would love to, to hear. And also that, that I should say that the Jewish, um, that the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., um, is collecting documents and photographs that are related to this story, um, to these refugees of the East. So if you have that, please uh, write me and I will also connect you to the curator who is collecting those documents. And thanks again, Tally, it was such a pleasure. Likewise, thank you. Wow, such an incredible lesson in history. Um, thank you so much, Professor Deckel, for all your efforts and for sharing your findings. And I can only imagine what an um, incredible uh, journey this must have been for you to uh, piece together your father's past and trace his footsteps and ultimately uncover such a unique part of our history. Yeah, thank you so much. It, it, yeah, it, it, it really is, it was. It. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rabbi Sessler, for leading the conversation and for this very intriguing and informative um, session tonight. And thank you everyone who logged on and joined us for tonight's program. A recording of our event tonight can be found on our website at sephardictemple.org. So feel free to um, review it later, share it with your friends and, and purchase the book and support Professor Deckel and learn more about this um, interesting history. Thank you. Thanks Have a great again. night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night Good and book it to be well, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.